and uh, Mr. Mahmoud Bashir, President, Nino Abdul Council. Welcome, nice to meet you. And Mr. Hassan Mohammed, Deputy Minister, Minister of Climate Change, Environment and Energy. Nice to meet you. All welcome. I'm grateful for your presence participation. Uh, I don't want to present any introduction. We go and listen to the panelists directly. But just uh, want to share a model that we are working in these days in SCAP and Afghan, and that's called, I'm sure you are aware of it, the Science Policy Action Nexus. So there are a lot of scientific knowledge available. All of us are ready to work hard, day and night, to implement, to act. In between, actually, the policy <coughs> side is not very really totally clear. So what is the end? I think that's an area that probably need so uh, we, are, we, are, we are now trying to uh, understand better and get concrete examples and evidence how our disaster reduction and climate change adaptation measures uh, can contribute or convert to uh, effective, useful policies. And that policy, I think, should be defined. What we mean by the policy, that's a very, very good thing in our own world. And also action. So without further uh, introduction and the details, uh, the first step actually is that to see what's there in, in, in reality as we speak now what's happening. So I'd like to ask our uh, panelists, uh, the question is that if there are examples on how your respective agencies actually uh, received and dropped the climate change adaptation and disaster reduction, into plan and action. If there is concrete examples of how your respective uh, agencies has done, so disaster reduction, climate change, uh, sort of planning and policy development and implementation. To be more concrete, we can consider a specific area such as the building codes for safety, like safety regulations, land development, forecasting, that's the response. Uh, please, if I may, start from you on the left side, and then uh, we'll be seeing you over on the distinguished panelists would like to take the floor. Mm -hmm. Briefly mention, yes, if you have any comments. So, um, uh, thank you very much, people. Um, I'm, I'm from Ministry of Content and Infrastructure. Um, I work in the coastal development section, um, which mainly focuses on land reclamation, coastal protection, and um, power. So on our side, um, we mainly focus on um, conducting the PSRP projects for these three sectors. And uh, for us, um, where we mostly use climate adaptation data and the reduction data is in designing the project. So um, we take into consideration um, current sea levels and sea level rise projections when we are designing our project. Um, and the data that we use uh, are mostly the oceanographic data for change waves and currents, um, and then sediment project, uh, sediment movement data, like the erosion and migration around islands. So those kind of data is what we usually use um, to target and design projects for the island. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. So, so Hassan, if you can also- My time is not short, but uh, <laughs> when you started the organization, you know, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, policy actions, when we talk about this area, is something that we are very aware of. And uh, we know that uh, climate change is not a distant, but currently reality and different things. We are victimizing our north of us in the intensity of frequency of weather related disasters, and we know that. Uh, the past two incidents that we faced in December 31st and January 23rd, we, we had a huge floods that actually disrupted a lot of the services in the capital city in We had uh, several damages to the houses there. And from that incident, also, we, we know that uh, what are the actions we took. But I find that uh, there are six important areas that we still, you know, need to strengthen among the agencies while responding to such incidents. One is that uh, strengthening the data chain, which we 
know, but still, uh, we, 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 we have done that, that, you know, agencies, especially the last management, all these meteorological services, and other responding agencies. But when we talk about that, as we are in data managing, we are, we are still very poor. And, we, and the way that we want the data in these agencies is not in a way that we can easily access the data itself. And again, uh, the second thing is that um, center in the stakeholder coordination and collaboration. We always feel that data is something very secret. We don't like to share it. And it's not easily available for the agencies to take it and take actions for decision making. And the other one is that uh, conducting risk assessments. You know, each and every after each and every incident that we face in Mali, also in the at home, uh, risk assessment is something that is very important to identify the hazards and vulnerabilities of the cities and then as well as at the local level to identify and you know to to further design and prepare for longer term mitigation projects and initiatives, initiatives, but these types of risk assessment that we do are not taken into consideration by European stakeholders. And the other thing is uh, strengthening policies to promote translating disaster data and tools into policy action. We are very good and professional in creating and writing policies, regulations and stuff. But the thing is that uh, we we always keep them in the shelves, and we we uh, we do let in exercising and practicing these these policies, I mean, these policies and regulations uh, to you know deal with disasters and minimize the effects of of this climate change hazards that we face in the mountains. So again, um, uh, this also leads in multi agency uh, coordination, which improves improves the disaster response capacity and time. However, this is something that we still need to do in our standard. And the other thing is the capacity building. We always talk about capacity building and the less capacity of our, our regional uh, responding agencies. I, I, I can give a list of things that you know, we face. Uh, if we take the, the, the recent example, that's the means within NDMA, within the Mauritius. Meteorological services, also the responding agency itself, especially the more police service and more legal represent. So, again, um, disaster management is everyone's business, and resources sharing and capacity building is something that you know we need to build ourselves together, coordinating with the, these agencies. And also, the other thing is the most important, I think innovation and technology. We are, we are far behind in bringing in the latest technology into this field. And again, um, when we talk about technology, I think the technical people within the, within the agencies is very, very important. This is something that we know we need to get work of support from our partner agencies to work together. And I believe that this is some area that we need to look forward to. So, thank you very much. I think this has been a comprehensive list of six critical elements. And uh, what all they can capture uh, from the discussion so far, things like the data on general policy, uh, innovation, coordination, sharing of the data on access, and also the risk assessment are on actually the topics that we have to deal with. Uh, just, just in between to contribute to this question, I think uh, it would be good to review the current policy. I think it seems that among all these topics, this is the least uh, identified or defined actually clear piece. Uh, just to share an idea, in new definitions, sometimes the public policy, especially they say that policy is not just high level uh, framework, paper, and a statement, <clears throat> is uh, to review the proposed solutions by the scientific communities or any sector, and then choose the best appropriate solutions. 
that told us if they help you commit a long term development costs. And then, more importantly, is to roll out and create consensus understanding and agreement in the country among the people about those solutions. And that takes time and energy so that after a while, uh, the people in the communities in the forest or most remote actually part as not those who are in the capital of the senior policy level uh, positions have same level of understanding as to what are the long-term solutions of, of the country to tackle actually issues such as climate change and disasters. So that policy is now very much about creation of consensus. Um, on this common understanding agreement, thanks very much for this comprehensive list. If I may go well, your concrete examples, please. If in your work, in your agency work, you, you have concrete examples how successfully or sometimes challenging examples of, of bringing this disaster reduction and climate change adaptation into uh, something like uh, policy and also implementing. And, what was the result of the brief dimensional example? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the um, uh, There is the, as Hassan, Hassan also mentioned, but there is a huge gap, uh, uh, which is basically creating this gap, data silos, and the the digital infrastructure of governance. Still, we are on electronic governance. You know, that the whole public uh, administration system is in the electronic governance system, uh, which it was uh, basically uh, expired in 2010. Uh, so there is a huge uh, demand or need to shift from electronic governance to digital governance system. So uh, to adopt the GIS system, so to adopt uh, in an official uh, in an official communication manner, to adopt this uh, GIS system, so to adopt uh, any digital uh, management system. The whole public administration needs to shift from uh, the e governance to just uh, this one of the huge in public administration. But for the ministries and authorities, I think there is a huge challenge because all uh, the finances, finance and uh, planning is the policy planning and decisions are made by cabinet. But for the local councils, we have some autonomy. We, are, uh, we have uh, our own budgets and uh, also the plans are not that very free even when we then uh, shift to digital. So we haven't directly uh, implemented or initiated any 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 plan to on DRR or such, but initially for for as a basic or necessity. We are shifting from e governance to the digital governance. So, within uh, three or uh, two months' time, our uh, digital governance uh, framework systems and software will be ready. By then, only I think uh, after that, we are, uh, we are trying to go public with the data, ask people, uh, provide the reports to the public more transparent and then uh, after our public and uh, government engagement after that we are going to have another uh, revised plan for the uh, thank you very much so notably shifting from electronic administration of public administration to digital one i think uh, is, is a is a priority and only i think the gap that you mentioned and that actually uh, matches very well with the fixed priority that Mr. Son mentioned that has you know, and the need for science and technology to come and help. So I think uh, hand in hand goes with that actually. Um, and I think uh, innovation also next to it. So that's beyond digital capacity. 
So innovation cannot be also envisioned as local and it can be broader and inclusive. I think that's where actually the human factors also come. So we are not totally relying or dependent on the, the, the digital technology, but also people are still uh, at the center. And we make sure that we have different centers of uh, not only in directing our assistance to the people, but also in uh, creating uh, people centers. So those methodologies and approach that at large at the end of the people or the decision makers and creators. Uh, thanks very much for your intervention. If I invite you, please to share your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, something has covered extensively. Um, yeah, also, um, I'll just for example from the ministry itself that we are working on uh, projects like our uh, objective main objective is to increase resilience of our islands. And also, sort of climate um, change and adaptation and mitigation is a part of it. Um, like one example, for example, um, through one project, um, we are developing, uh, we are currently using it and also developing it further as a tool, a machine learning tool, which can you know, map out shorelines in the island. So, from that, uh, using satellite imagery, we can. Uh, see which islands have uh, zones of depression and erosion. So then these, using these imagery, for example, we are currently developing a uh, cost of vulnerability index list. So this list um, will tell us, uh, we can identify which islands are more in danger in terms of population, infrastructure, or in erosion. So then now we can, uh, we also have to be on a more monitoring basis. Um, the infrastructure implementation is obviously in the Ministry of um, Construction and Infrastructure, Construction and Infrastructure, sorry. Um, so we do, as Ms. San also mentioned, we have to collaborate and work together with other agencies in capacity building and sharing information and also working together that we don't overlap in our work and then only like these policies can be directed to actual work on the ground, which is productive. So we will, we will obviously be working with Ministry of Construction and Infrastructure, for example, in this instance to um, develop this list with information they have so that we can identify which islands on a priority basis require our attention more for in coastal protection, for example. And then uh, there are other things also we are looking at in terms of protected areas or nature-based solutions, for example, coral restoration or mangrove restoration. These are also like within the projects, the adaptation part is a very big component. And uh, we obviously acknowledge that it is a big concern. So it is incorporated in the projects. And uh, so yeah, like in general, the policies and the projects and implementation is very much geared and guided with these things in mind, even currently. And we can improve on it further. Um, yeah. And in terms of data, I mentioned like the availability of data to the public, um, in my opinion, needs to be improved, obviously. And for instance, this could be, um, for example, MMS. Um, it, sometimes it is very difficult for the public or even the say, engineers to access data for their projects from our meteorological service. So hopefully we can in the future develop ways that it can be accessed more easily so that we can incorporate it further in our projects or other work. So particularly the agencies together with potentially NGOs also um, and other government agencies also we can work together to improve these services and get a better solution for our problems. Uh, thank you very much. I think yeah, two things come to my mind. One actually is the usability of data. What type of actually that information can be used? Here, I think globally, there are a lot of efforts to develop the 
has of that one information, so on seismology, meteorology, hydrology, lots of things. But actually now it seems that we need more type of process and build that up. So it's not only improving the hazard specificities and characteristics, but also the vulnerability sites and exposure. So we are going toward actually risk that one. That's something which is usable by policy makers, decision makers, economists, area planners. Uh, so that's whose job is this? So I'm raising this question for the next part after we listen to Mr. Shari. Is, is it anybody's strategic job or we should do it together so that we can we can further develop the available uh, if you have a role for mission that on the hazards and we to develop it. I mean, initiatives such as the established and resilience portal, which was presented in the last session, is one region of that. But at national level, how can you talk? But uh, let's go to the over uh, Mr. Shari for the intervention on this first topic first. Mr. Shari, please go ahead and share your thoughts and experiences. If you can listen. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, uh, sometimes there are some uh, difficulties in uh, communication, but uh, I think uh, it is manageable. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mustafa Chair. Uh, good morning and uh, salam alaikum. And first of all, my apologies for not participating physically today uh, due to uh, several reasons. Um, uh, I'm the Deputy Director General, uh, Head of the Weather Service, Maldives Meteorological Service. Uh, when we uh, talk about the, uh, always about the uh, weather and uh, uh, climate change, uh, I think it is, uh, uh, we better refer the, uh, at the WMO state of the climate report in Asia, which uh, convincingly uh, reports uh, with robust evidence, established the linkages and relationships of climate change risks with sustainable development goals on how carbon dioxide concentration linked to greenhouse effect drives climate change indicators such as uh, global warming, sea level rise, rain forces and global climate drivers that lead to extreme high impact events and its implication on sustainable development of Asia. The unique geographical challenges of the Maldives, Maldives islands, such as flat and low line, and their dispersal across the large area pose additional threats. The climate change impacts exacerbate existing social, economic, cultural vulnerabilities in Maldives. We in Maldives, being an island country, have been already experiencing significant negative impacts of climate for quite a while. The rising seas threaten our entire country while the warmer oceans and enhanced adverse weather activities pose a grave risk to our lives and livelihoods, impacting all aspects of our life. Three years ago, We were severely impacted by the extremely severe tropical cyclone, Tauktai, and the monsoonal floods that greatly affected our idols, Hiladumati, Gaf Alif, Ha, and Haddumati. Last month, as I think mentioned by uh, Sir Hisan, we have experienced severe flooding in many islands. All these factors have transboundary dimensions and hence 
regional internet international cooperation is very important to us all this vulnerability necessitates immediate and effective translation of climate data into actionable policies though the sdg funded uh, through the <coughs> sdg funded project escape has collected and analyzed comprehensive climate and disaster related data based on the la latest and till date most accurate information from coupled model intercomparison project phase 6 which is popularly known, known as cmip6 climate projection models in collaboration with asia pacific climate change adaptation information platform the data has been downscaled to make it suitably suitable for subnational analysis using advanced geospatial technology and satellite data for predictive analysis this project has identified the climate risk and assess the impacts of climate change but also through the web based decision support system through risk and resilience portal it provides scientific evidence and guidance for developing policies and action plans the up to date climate data and science will ensure future adaptation and disaster scenarios are prioritized and addressed in the local development planning process they will help planning they will help in planning investment in resilient infrastructure to withstand climate impacts such as elevated structures and sea walls in risk hotspots this data can be used to undertake initiatives for enhancing local capacities in understanding climate data and implementing adaptation measures such as natural based solutions escape has also developed some methodologies for impact based forecasting for more this meteorological service along with conducting hands on training on train on cap, uh, and capacity building of more this meteorological service technical resources as part of this project the capacity building activities undertaken during the project will strengthen institutional frameworks and capacity of mms to better coordinate climate adaptation action and building climate resilience help in better understand and impact of climate risks on vulnerable population it also helps to assess to assess the impacts of short term weather phenomena such as swell surges and cyclone storms based on weather forecasts as well as enhance preparedness for seasonal weather anomalies MMS already has established mechanisms in place for monitoring weather patterns, seismological events, and generating of early warning. However, the data and the information produced can enhance the quality of early warning, including potential impacts on the sector, and can help avoid damages of property and protection of lives due to extreme events over to you thank you thank you very much uh, mr shari it's a pleasure to have you online and thanks uh, for making the efforts to, to join us in this meeting there are several important points actually mentioned uh, in your uh, intervention i think uh, around again the data of the uh, especially some specific regular geospatial i think this is a very important uh, 
sort of fundamental area that is a, a platform or actual foundation for many of the things that we are doing. Uh, thanks very much uh, for uh, all the interventions and the thoughts and the examples that you provided around this topic. I think we uh, mentioned a few gaps in the interventions that you had. Philip, uh, I can ask from uh, your mind, what could be the uh, one single most important gap which currently exists in your area of work? I mean, there are several mentioned already we have it, but if you want to choose the most urgent one and the most critical, most fundamental one that you think is a priority in your area of work, could uh, you please mention one most important challenge that they have, which today is there and you have to address it? Uh, appreciate it. So, um, <laughs> So, um, when we talk in about gaps, I think it's been more than my fellow panelists as well. One of the most urgent issues um, is within the data. So, um, I have point A and B. So, all right. So, um, so we have a limited uh, data availability for us. So, in our scope of work, um, we need long term, reliable, consistent, and quality um, data for us to be able to. Um, design projects specific to those islands. So um, each island has its own environmental conditions around it. So it's kind of copy pasting um, the design on this all on the islands and expect it to be effective. So for us um, to be able to um, enhance our designs and make it more effective, we need island specific long term data on oceanographic um, and um, geographic conditions of the island. Relating to that, um, I think the next one would be uh, and using this uh, long-term data to identify the risk hotspots. So currently, um, I feel that something that we can improve upon is um, not being as reactive. So when you're facing coastal erosion or an intervention or something, of a project of that sort, it's mostly a reactive action taken on a long-term persistent problem. So if we have the data that is long term data is collected and available for the ministry or the um, relevant stakeholders, uh, it would help us identify the risk of spots and um, enable us to address those um, areas before the actual problem on the ground becomes extremely, extremely critical. So currently, when that environment comes to us, when one of the infrastructures is on the verge of falling into the sea. So at that point, um, we can't go back and look at the long-term data because we don't have it and we don't have sufficient time to collect the data as well. So that is one of the biggest risks um, in the, in the gaps that I find in my scope of work. Thank you very much. So gap number one is section A and B. Yes. Section A actually, uh, lack of or insufficiency of long-term consistent data yes. and we actually identify the hotspots in advance yes. so we are prepared and we can take the preemptive and preventive measures thank you mr hassan please um, many thanks to uh, like disaster management i think uh, uh, the governance structure uh, we still don't take uh, facing disasters very seriously and the policy We really like to talk about climate change disasters in every forum outside and even locally, but still, how serious we take it, I, I think we, uh, it's not there still. And uh, first of all, yeah, the top policy makers, we think, I think. Uh, uh, this topic has to be taken up very seriously. And the other thing is that, of course, I totally agree with what Mama has mentioned. And we previously had a, a separate agency to deal with disasters. Also, I, I, we all know that uh, there was a planning ministry which mandated to specifically manage all the statistics and data. Still, of course, yes, uh, the statistics department is, you know, uh, 
we and the some ministry of data, I'm not sure, but I think uh, somehow with the political changes, the statistics department has not given that, that importance to, you know, given the mandate to, you know, look and manage all these data. As we know that uh, data is available in each form, in all, under all the ministries and agencies, but what are we doing? And the proper, you know, management of data is not properly taken care of. So I think, first of all, um, the policy makers should should take it seriously. And then, yes, I think uh, a way that we could we could bring all the data to one agency and manage it from one agency could be helpful for all agencies. Just because uh, we are small and geographically the formation of more itself also other challenges. And, uh, I think if, if we give a proper importance to the data center itself, then this is something that we could, you know, look into and people would be able to access the data much more easily. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, we are born that way to react to disasters. We like reacting, but we, we are very poor, poor in being prepared and, you know, practice and exercise to you know a future disasters that may face to us but for us firefighting firefight finishing move people to you know the guest houses and then forget it the next day for us it's very easy because for uh maybe probably for uh for beginnings we hope that uh, such big disasters that we do not face but you know for us reacting to these kinds of climate change disasters and the human made disasters for us it's easy. But yeah, I may say that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I think uh, what, what I captured is that the insufficiency to be diplomatically correct. Oh well, <laughs> policy making seriousness <laughs> or policy making seriousness, it is a gap. I mean, you mentioned some of the cause three causes for that. I mean, in general, it's not the, the priority that should be. Huh? So that creates the lack of seriousness for the determination. Uh, thanks very much. If what I, I mean is that, uh, you know, first of all, to make this all right, yes. the policymaker should know what, what why we are doing this, you know, the seriousness yeah. of keeping the data. Then not the data things yes. go the right way. Good day. Thank you. Please, one important, the first important gap that you have in your work and you want to highlight it. Yeah. Convey uh, the message. Uh, previously, I mentioned about the age yes. of the electronic governance. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, the legal framework. No. There is no digital legal framework, which is fine. We are, we are one, uh, one institute for. Uh, one ministry is uh, a framework where they share the data the legal they share in the API there is no such uh, legal framework for the uh, the, the, the lack of framework also the the, uh, there's the challenge the challenge of identifying who owns the data so data custodian is not very clear and identified some of the data are centrally managed which is actually uh, which is uh, some of the data are centrally managed but which is actually the, the local council takes the custody and some of the data are managed by or collected by local councils which is actually central administration of the data uh, which uh, brings uh, less transparency, yeah. of course, due to, due to the reason which is transparency. Uh, there is a huge, it's not one gap, but that. Yeah, so, so yeah. there is a huge gap in planning and designing uh, collaboration. Yeah. So, because of this uh, uh, data custody issues, uh, legal, legal framework issues, and digital infrastructure. The collaboration is very important, mm -hmm. right? And so, for long term, or 
that's been consistent that our issues did not happen without this gap in between. Uh, also, which also lets a uh, planning framework. That's a framework for budget planning, but there isn't a specific framework for development planning where uh, central government, the previous government couldn't even publish their development plan. So we, we can't stick, we, we can't align to the uh, uh, central government plans, right? And there is no legal requirement for island councils to harmonize the island development plan to territorial development plan. But there is a legal requirement to harmonize Island development plan, national development plan, and federal development plans are required to be harmonized with national development. But uh, adult development plans are sub regional plans. Island councils are not required to harmonize their development plans with the federal Those are very unique aspects. Thank you uh, very much. I mean, the reason that I'm uh, focusing on Wong Gap because uh, I think it will help. If we put the gaps and challenges in a logical order, I mean, to borrow from the economist, the term value chain. Uh, so we, we know that we challenge as what type of value and priority. That's why it's good to have in our mind, in our work, and prioritize challenges. So, first one, second one, third one, and each of them has a certain value. And that value chain, or if you not hack at all of these regions of this chain, then you will not get to our objective, which is there. Uh, can you please also mention one most important gap that you have been on? Yeah, I think um, from a policy perspective and the importance of data has been highlighted. Um, one thing um, I like to mention is um, the importance of using um, new technology, innovative technology. Uh, and, and adopt them rather than, for example, sticking with or relying what has been done in the past. Then this is also very much related to, for example, data itself in terms of risk reduction or financial reduction, for example. Um, let's say we want to get um, imagery or, like, for example, a shoreline imagery or coastal imagery or even make use of land use maps. Like instead of um, doing some, may potentially, you have to obviously do ground truth in, but instead of extensively doing surveys or using extensive resources that can be used in surveying or other things, we could rather focus on the current technologies which is available to us, maybe to get a subscription or something, for example, to do imagery for a certain amount of frequency which we can then use and then limit the amount of work we are doing in person just to like, maybe that can be used as a verification, but use this innovative um, technology that is available to do uh, monitoring and um, even form this, for example, the risk we made, or even policing, for example, in certain areas. Uh, so that I think adopting uh, innovative solutions and technology, which is currently available to us, uh, obviously from foreign entities, because they have the access to it, but we can form collaborations and partnerships and do, uh, even like from, uh, from our agencies can do subscriptions that we can access their technology. That is, I think, one thing that can be very useful uh, to us. And obviously the others have uh, mentioned very good. Thank you. Uh, new innovative technology, innovative, uh, inclusive, resilient, sustainable. So, all actually are, are interconnected. Thank you. Mr. Shari, could you please also mention one most important gap that should be addressed in your area of work? Yeah, thank you. Uh, for data, uh, I, I can say the uh, Maldives Meteorological Service is uh, uh, one of the uh, best organization uh, even in this region to share the data. We have no no restriction uh, 
and anyone can uh, ask for data and we will provide data but uh, uh, for us uh, uh, collecting data uh, we have uh, uh, some difficulties and some gaps uh, like there are some uh, uh, GIS data uh, in, in, in some organizations uh, within the uh, government and also bathymetry data which is required for uh, for us to, uh, to do forecast and do some uh, prediction uh, which is also uh, not available to us and also the uh, the impact data that, uh, from uh, different islands yeah, but I think the uh, local councils uh, and city councils they may be uh, collecting all these data and uh, perhaps they are in the database with NDMA uh, but for impact based forecasting uh, uh, we, we should have a data catalog uh, it is important for us and uh, if if these are being uh, continuously uh, uh, dispatched to, uh, or shared by more, uh, them to more mythological service, I think uh, we we will have a, a very good uh, uh, you know forecast uh, mechanism. And also, while we are uh, working for impact based forecasting, this is very important for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sharif. I think uh, so far we discussed a little bit about the existing situation, concrete examples, priorities, and also the gaps. Again, I think uh, it, it's a, a use, useful effort to prioritize and uh, put the gaps in order in a structured way so that we can bring it to planning. I mean, it is good to have a big picture and then we have to be specific. I think, as I mentioned, models such as this value chain model can give us the opportunity to score each action that should be taken and then uh, we can be, uh, we, we'll be able to prioritize them. Uh, but the next question actually is that, okay, this is the current situation, these are the gaps, and how we can tackle address the gaps improve our performance and uh, impact if we consider actions, what we do, result, outcome of our projects, programs, and impact, which is the improvement of life of people at the end, that's safety, welfare, resilience, all these things. I think we can aim at the highest level, and that is the impact level. If we that, consider that one, then what will be the strategies? and processes and thinking and logic that can take us from the existing situation to that desirable impact level situation. Uh, I would like to hand over now the moderation of the session to our distinguished panelist, Mr. Hison Hassan. To continue and I apologize for leaving. I was called for an important online meeting called actually that I should leave. But uh, I personally enjoy very much in this Discussion feedback on project. I'm sure that the rest of the session will be uh, even more impactful as as we speak. So thanks very much. If I may hand over to Mr. I will actually I I still want to sit here because yeah. I want to ask the question. Okay. But I told Omar to order it and yeah. I will get the same question. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The strategies and ways to and balance the challenges that we have actually. While we are switching, maybe I add just one or two lines. Considering all of the uh, comments that we had from the panelists, I think that the uh, at least risk and resilient portal and some of the data that has been shared through this project can answer to at least partial parts of the request and gaps that was shared from the panelists. For example, right now, the Risk and Resilient Portal allows the share of the available data free, uh, open to all public uh, in a user-friendly, basically non-technical way. Uh, so you can see the land use, land cover maps, all of the 
uh, boundaries of the atolls and islands that was uh, basically received from the uh, land survey authority uh, as well as uh, some of the data that was uh, actually shared from Ministry of Environment uh, in the past two years, uh, we have a lot of collaboration with uh, NDMA uh, under uh, leadership of Mr. Hisan. So he can uh, also comment on that aspect because I think we are getting a little bit closer to also kind of looking at this project and how it can really play uh, into the kind of issues and gaps that might be identified from the panel and uh, how it can help or it can be enhanced as well, like in the upcoming future to provide more kind of opportunities uh, for everybody. Uh, yes, yes, please don't. Okay. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I, I would be a bit more straightforward than uh, Dr. Mustafa. Yeah, um, I think we've heard very interesting uh, topics on the existing things and mainly around data and data sharing, data collection and analysis. But um, I know the colleagues in the panel uh, very well, starting from uh, colleagues uh, Omar from Ministry of Construction. Uh, to my uh, boss, and I hope I don't get a bad impression of this. And and um, Mr. Bashir from Known Council, to my colleague from the Ministry of Environment, and and uh, Ali Shari from Ministry. These are maybe the colleagues who who has been working with us for for a very long time. So this uh, session is also about how do we put you know words into action. How do we see through the challenges that we have and find a way forward in terms of um, you know bridging those gaps, making making sure that the collaboration continues and the partnership, you know, we, we go beyond the challenges through partnership uh, and sharing and, and everything. So next gen. So how do we improve and strategize on uh base we call on way forward? Um, maybe we, we could have additional, you know, uh, strategies in place or data sharing mechanisms. Uh, all in all, how do we improve um, the current workflows and data sharing, data collection mechanisms that, that we already have to make sure that we bridge the gaps that, that we have of, of, uh, today. Um, I think I'll start from here and then we'll move, move to the other side. Um, I think it is um, currently maybe it's very difficult for the data to be centralized in the person. If there are like, I don't think anyone would want to like, give, give up ownership of the data in the sense, uh, but sharing is obviously important. So, but in my opinion, I think if we give ownership to Separate entity, which would be like statistics, statistics bureau or something. And then, uh, but obviously, the data collection and uh, how it is presented will be on the technical expertise of each individual agency or body which is dealing with that project. Um, but yeah, one um, entity could be uh, responsible for the database management and how it is uh, presented, how it can be accessed. That could be there, but I, I guess that requires a lot of collaboration and uh, it can be a very challenging um, task. But like uh, that probably is one of the best ways and also the availability of data digitally in a very user-friendly manner is very important. Uh, and that is, I think, something we uh, that they say in terms of coastal engineering or like even like stormwater design, so that those are uh, lacking right now. And maybe also what is lacking is potentially data in um, different formats that can be more useful to the end user. So currently, if the data is not assimilated properly or in one sort of format, or even not presented in a useful way, for example, like um, IFT curves, it's just a general example, then it can be very difficult for the end user to, again, process the data and use it for whatever purpose they are uh, working on. 
So that sort of uh, centralized process can be very useful, um, but like yeah, again, I'm not entirely sure how that would <laughs> how like you would even how would you would start the process or but like yeah, we need technology plus I guess um, collaboration and everyone working together in a sense with. Um, over arching body, I suppose, directing this in a way, like pushing it forward. Uh, so then it is with the current technology, it is of course uh, possible. Other countries are doing it, uh, they have a centralized system or certain aspects, like for example, even if it's weather related or erosion related data, they can access it centrally. And so, for example, environmental managers or and engineers can access it through them. Uh, so that sort of mechanism, streamlined mechanism would be very helpful, but yeah, um, there are some challenges of this thing. One more question. How do we strategize to uh, bridge the challenges that we have already highlighted in the discussion? Yeah. Um, send, uh, uh, centrally, uh, Transforming the whole public administration system to digital administration, I don't think it's important. But for individual ministries, I, I think that you both individually can uh, shift. And councils do, do have autonomy and budget also. I, I thought that they, they also can shift. So it doesn't. Uh, individually, uh, trans, uh, each, each of the public administrative uh, department authority individually transforming uh, to uh, 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 a digital environment ERP doesn't limit the communication systems within the RAN. MCIT might not be that uh, authority yet, but MCIT has the ability to. So integrate or I have I have been working so there are no limitation. Current gems could be integrated to any ERP system that we adopt. Current gems uh, could be integrated to any DS system that we adopt. So the, the, the uh, central body uh, authorizing or initiating a, such a project is nothing that so far I have seen in any plan. So, but it is for individual councils or departments or ministries to initiate it because we are we have already been working with it for like one year and now we are very much in the finish. So the other, other thing is uh, showcasing our, our work and so that our others could get to know more about it, uh, and, uh, be more transparent after the work so that public also know the difference. Yeah, why why this department is so transparent and others are what happened. So public will question and, and other institutions will be also required for the transformation. So I think decentrally doing it is the way forward and maybe now we can do as the so uh, the past 10 or 12 years, it doesn't transform the way the world has changed. So I think it's, it's one way. I will also answer the question of the assent from the environment. I think first of all, what we need to do is to do a simulation analysis of the feedback of this issue. All the relevant stakeholders, policy makers should sit like this in one forum and talk about the issues of data sharing, data management. And I think on a national level, the dialogue should actually bring all these, all these issues that we are discussing right now into one table and then find out what are we talking about, how serious these issues. And I think that, that there we could start. And then to move forward with how, how we could bring changes and address this issue. So I, I would 
make it short and say that uh, we need uh, it's not us who always needs, needs to talk about this. It should be all the relevant ministries, agencies, including the policy makers, policy level. We need the one table and then talk about it and then find out solutions. I agree with uh, what my uh, fellow panelists said today um, on the situation. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we can do is to um, still improve uh, stakeholder uh, coordination, um, especially between the relevant government authorities and ministries. Um, for one thing, to um, avoid the duplicity of work, so this is um, stepping on each other's foot, um, and also to make sure that um, the work is done most efficiently. So, in this regard, I think it is uh, quite important that we do have a central um, database uh, with all the data that we do have, because um, individually, uh, everybody is doing their best to manage the data, but um, sometimes. Uh, the relevant ministries are not aware that that information is available. So mm -hmm. that sometimes we do go and take our own research and um, duplicate effort and financial strength along with it um, to collect a data that's pretty interesting in another ministry or under another entity. So uh, central database management is um, quite important. Um, but then as uh, the the minister also highlighted, um, it will come with its own set of challenges. Um, there's always a certain amount of resistance to change. Um, uh, going into a new flow of working is going to be difficult. Um, as said, so uh, it is important that all the relevant stakeholders gather together um, in such forum um, and discuss how they can um, foresee working together and sharing the data. Because um, being a uh, Central custodian of the data is also quite a big job. Um, so everybody has to agree on how the data would be managed and who would have access to it and how they can access it. So as I mentioned earlier, it would come up with a lot of challenges um, once we start to think about implementing this change. Ali? He has to. He has to uh, disconnect because of an emergency. Okay. Yeah. 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 Maybe in episode five. Uh, I think we are all talking about uh, things to have a centralized database that everyone can access. But I think the main challenges uh, to have that is. Uh, Actually, in no agency is holding want to hold their own data under their uh, administration. But the main challenge is that in, in some agencies, they have different data format. And you want to integrate this data in different formats. Uh, there are some challenges to integrate the data in different format for a single so This is also one of the challenges that we may face during uh, working of the data. So, in short, uh, keeping our own data by ourselves, it doesn't really uh, do any benefit. So we want to, our data to be utilized as much as possible because we are investing not on data collection, especially in methodology. So we want our data to be utilized by the community. I mean, we are really providing in the format. Yeah, I think all, all good points. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly summarize the last bit and then open up for a uh, question and answer. I think what we, what we generally talked about is open data channels. Uh, how do we agree on open data formats and how do we make sure that our data is accessible to uh, both uh, intra agency uh, sharing? Um, and utilization and also open to the public and uh, the, the short term strategy to solve existing issues would be uh, for individual officers to take on as much accountability to keep their data as open as possible. Um, and the medium term solution would be how do we um, integrate existing um, databases and lines of communication to other enterprises or 
uh, planning softwares and in the long run, um, the ideal situation would be to establish a, a national data sharing entity that would be the custodian of how do we share data um, rather than centralizing um, all forms of data. So I think that has been the gist of the conversation in the panel. Um, with that, I will open up for questions and answers, and I hope to see Dr. Rakhwal is very interested. Yes, yes. Uh, I think within this panel, it's sort of the idea highlighted that data sharing, um, whether it be posting data, collecting the data, uh, editing the data, data is the issue. And if, when we were talking about what could be done to identify how best to mitigate these issues, but in fact, there are challenges associated with it, especially for this idea of bringing everyone together into a forum. It's, it's going to be a really big challenge, in my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of red tape associated with something like that, a lot of red tape that might be associated with creating a central database chain. So in the opinion of analysts, do you think um, perhaps an independent organization that could collect and manage data, so a non-governmental organization that could collect and manage data, provide it as required to overcome some of these um, red tape issues? So this the model has been tried out at the locations. Could that possibly be a, a way to overcome some of the challenges that we have between connecting within the company? Or a private party? Not necessarily a private party, perhaps an independent organization. It's associated, it doesn't have to be private, could be a public or private. The, the institute is the NCIT. So, this is where they still have the capacity also. But I think um, the, in my perspective, the challenge is not the data, it's not the data collection, data is there. The challenge is public administrative software that they are used, which is not, which is limiting the sharing potential. So, um, for NCIT, and, and NCIT doesn't have that legal authority, but it's also one thing. So, uh, there is a central database, I, I would say, they have uh, potential, they have experience, and there is so, uh, a lot, lot of history also. But there is a limitation in the current administrative. Uh, I'm Shuja from Bombay Telecom to uh, Council President. I think uh, we have been up for this series that uh, the self defined implementation and coordination will be defined. So everyone has their, uh, their data and it's very practical. Even the difficulty to design and the difficulty to design itself. It's very much uh, politically, even the ministries themselves, they don't have any say, particularly uh, design the project the best way to minimize the impact of the environment, which is potential because of the, the end result come difficult. So that has to be eliminated somewhere. Sure, uh, even the room we see here today, we don't find that much uh, that kind of thing that's within ourselves in the room here. Because the policy makers at the very top, they don't understand, they don't understand what we are talking about. So, uh, I, I think that the target audience to provide these information should be come at the very top. We know everybody here, he understands it. We know what we want, but the question is at the top level how much they understand, how much willingness are there from their side to so remedy these operations so that maybe the issues will have been. And it's like for a PSAP project, it's going to happen in Ireland. Uh, the EAA did the environment. Impact assessment uh, the studies. They always come up with the, the way that the project is implemented. There will be like some risk for the, the damages which is caused from the project. But it lacks how we can remedy what is the solution. 
even with that teleportation, which required the we have not so much of those kind of things. Those are the small things and a lot of big issues, even in the case of design and the data uh, utilization within these objects or objects. So those are the, the main made factors which increase the data. If you just said it a little bit of the tediousness that is the of course. So that is one of the big gap we have to decide on how we want to use it. That is a huge gap we have to fill. And again, uh, the, the national data, which has become, which is uh, public data, which has to be open up or publicly available, it has become a national As Mr. Dashir has mentioned, uh, the national development plan it has to be publicly open. Even like for us, it's like uh, local level uh, governors. For us, there is, we have never seen this. And there is no collaboration or no alignment, local plans, the national plans. So there is no integration with the plans. And at the end of the day, it's like five years down for presidency. So he, he does and he, he finished with whatever the projects he, he's gonna uh, be doing. With the target audience, which is politically motivated, and the end result is not good. The end of the day. So I think there is much effort we have to do with the collaboration, uh, making the policy makers more serious. I think uh, the digital health, uh, uh, the, the digitization, and the data sharing will actually. During the, the gap with the political creation, because the, uh, the, the more transparency in our our data, the justifications, the reports that we tag to them in our meeting uh, is something very very important, which has a lot of potential. For example, uh, currently uh, we. Uh, our, our plan is to uh, firstly adopt the GI system, secondly map the natural resources, and thirdly uh, uh, adopt uh, separate imagery so it's consistent. And fourthly, we are going for a public referendum on uh, an actual level land, which is not yet practically done anymore in the island level. Land use planning is done at all the land use planning is something uh, I think people have never thought about. Even the president doesn't do at all the land use planning, he just keeps silence and give it to someone, something like uh, land use, uh, allocation of tourism island is also something like you know. So, uh, our, our at all council is uh, more on uh, uh, perception of. Idea that once we map the natural resources, bring it to public with the natural features, capacity, potential, and ask them to vote for it. How, how would they like to use these islands? How would they like to use this uh, this plot of the land? With showing them the natural potential, and it's. Uh, uh, the, the, the biodiversity of food, the, the whole ecosystem and everything could be in such a way we could show somehow with the current GI systems. So after that, uh, if we are go, we are going going to propose the new government or the current government with the our at all land use plan, I am and on the idea that they will agree to some extent. The other the, the other challenge is which which we can actually solve a challenge that I have identified about the political will is the current administration is on an at all scale. Yeah, the, the regional governments are formed on at all scale, but the parliament is formed on uh, a smaller consequences which is divided in uh, and at all is divided in smaller For example, Mali is divided into 
keep clean for citizens. Or in other countries, the local government uh, administration consequences are very much aligned with the parliament consequences. For example, Male in, in other countries, Male is the one constituency administrative constituency, and the same administrative cons constituency is actually uh, also uh, in the parliament, but it could be a multi member constituency. Or, or in Mauritius, it is single member constituencies which is divided, they are divided. The, the administrative constituency in smaller development of constituency. We have a solution, uh, but the solution can not be uh, brought up. But uh, the, the previous one with the data transparency and with the uh, EI systems, uh, we could provide a justification. With the politics. So, very shortly, I think uh, we know the issues, we know the challenges, we know the gaps. I also I agree that uh, really all the policy makers and the senior authorities to one platform would be difficult, but I think this is something that we need to do in them and then find solutions for the issues, gaps, and find ways how we could you know address this issue. And I don't think I I don't think we should, you know, formulate a new agency for to make for the data management and data uh, taking because already the systems are already in place. The AM and CID who could help DNA department of national statistics. I think we what we need to do is that to strengthen these agencies to address these issues. We in this group. Of people, we know all the issues, challenges, gaps. I think the thing is that we need to bring all these uh, key people to one platform and then find solutions to address this issue. The current government has already started planning to develop a new 20, 20, 20 year development plan, and I think this is one avenue that this uh, issue could be, you know plugged into and uh, there should be a way that uh, the, this can be addressed in the 20 years action plan as well, so that it could continue. But what happens in all this is that uh, once the government changes that all these uh, somewhat important tasks or development plan status falls on a, a point of time and then it never continues and then the new things and plan starts and it just gets never addressed. So I, I'm sure that after five years, we will be still sit here talking about the same issues and we will ask the same questions and, and find out and ask uh, what have we done from that year to up to this year. So I think, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm mindful of the time as well. So if there's no any, you know, pressing questions, um, I will give the panel for uh, a very brief closing remarks. So, so I will close remarks. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm sure you uh, have an understanding of the technical difficulties um, we do face um, uh, with regards to climate change adaptation and disaster resilience. Um, um, I agree with uh, what Mr. Bashir has just said um, about. Uh, the community taking ownership of, of their own islands and making their own maps and using that as evidence to um, push for policies and projects on their own islands. I think that is a very um, inclusive way forward. Um, we would also wish to see projects going on based on more um, informed decision making and evidence based projects. So um, it's a very bright way ahead um, if communities could adopt um, a such a way to move forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, Uma yes. mentioned that you have captured it. Uh, we, are, we are already working on it, and it doesn't have to be for the council. At least, if one council could get out of the box and do it, I think it would be. So, thank you. 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 Th
So I think uh, the mental concept is for the Thank you. 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 Thank we to have a separate um, organization to make the database or deal with it. Um, one thing could be that like, we might think like, for example, as information technology people or engineers, like there is a very ideal solution, but you also have to take into context like the type of people or the agencies you are dealing with. So um, again, it might they might not be very open to that idea. In the sense, so it's all. I think the best way forward for them would be that with the new technology and the innovative ideas uh, anyone would have, like you try to strengthen the current organizations or agencies which are there, and then you provide support for them. In the sense, and then build their capacities and their technological um, uh, materials or equipment they have, and. Uh, give them ideas or not to move forward. Maybe it's not the uh, ideal solution you're looking for, but that might be the initial step towards doing something like that. And then in terms of the other thing what um, I mentioned, um, yeah, it is um, sometimes very difficult for us to um, like formulate projects and it might come from directly from the president's office or from the policies of the government itself. Um, maybe due to a pledge or a promise. So yeah, it, it, we all know that it is uh, it is understandable. But again, for example, some of the work we are doing in terms of working with the Ministry of Construction Infrastructure to identify prior, prioritize islands. And so for, if we are, for example, getting funding to do certain projects, then we will use these um, indexes or this that we have developed to put forward the islands which we think require them right now based on the data we have. So that is something I think we can do in our capacity. And one other thing is since we're talking about climate change adaptation, um, uh, some of the practices we are currently doing, let's say for example, for coastal development uh, in terms of gray infrastructure or hard engineering can be looked at as very male adaptive. So, and uh, that if we are in future proposing more climate adaptive solutions, for example, like hard engineering solutions such as growing plus soft solutions such as nourishment. Um, it, uh, like since the councilmen are also here, it will be, it is something that might not be accepted or looked positively by the public because it's not something that is currently done. For example, nourishment itself. So it, uh, it can, it, I'm, I'm not saying everyone, but it can possibly help because we always see developments of big um, coastal structures being implemented, right? So that's something that uh, these projects could get uh, could be supported by the councils and the public. And I think that also will come with more public increase in public awareness and telling them about, for example, nature-based solutions or these sort of engineering solutions which can be implemented. Because the more they know, then the more they will be receptive to it, right? and they will be happy to adapt those in their islands. So it is just something I wanted, uh, which is which is something which can be done from a uh, local capacity. Uh, even though, like as you said, the projects might be directed in certain places, but um, something that we can hopefully do is, um, even if the project is set up. We can potentially guide the technical people or the people working on the project, even if it's a foreign agency, to adapt to these measures which are currently being adopted in other more developed countries also here. And because it is successful, so we might be going towards another direction of more, and this will be more innovative solutions in that sense. Because hard engineering solutions usually come with issues that will come later uh, because those. Um, we don't have the data to do proper um, analysis to begin with before installation. So that's why it is that it is, yeah, with awareness, I think these things can be improved. So yeah, it was a very uh, productive talk, and I also learned quite a bit. And uh, hopefully, uh, we can 
work together with the agencies and also organizations and potentially private entities also. Um, and uh, yeah. in benefit of everyone, the public, and even like beneficial to people who are working in the sector professionals, because once things get easier, you get more work done. So, um, so yeah, hopefully we can move towards better solutions in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists. We will we will close this this session. And just one thing to add for those that are interested about the data issues, the session 10 today, the last session is about bringing data into DRR and CCA. So it's going to discuss about uh, uh, basically data governance, moving into uh, data related statistics and how it can help uh, with the issues of DRR and CCA to down scaling of projections. So that is uh, useful for island level, atoll level, uh, national level uh, analysis and then collection of the data as well. So it kind of goes through all the stages that you really uh, might be concerned about in terms of data. So if you're interested, please join us. Uh, good afternoon, all of the online participants. We are starting our uh, next session on a uh, roundtable discussion on mainstreaming, gender, and disasters, resilience, and climate change adaptation, which is moderated by Ms. Miki Kotanaka, head of SCAP South and Southwest Asia Office. Uh, Miki, please. Yeah, a good afternoon um, to everybody here in the room and also online. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this session. Thing that is very dear to me as well, gender mainstream. So um, Leila has already, you know, um, said the title. But as with everything in development or um, humanitarian, generally, the gender dimension, gender equality, you know, making sure no one's left behind. This is absolutely important, and it's also because the, uh, you know, the needs of um, women and men, children, it may be quite different, you know. And, uh, and how they access information, they, you know, process information, take action. It might, it, it is quite different often, and the roles they play can be very different. So it's absolutely important, and uh, we have a very distinguished panel um, that can share, you know, different perspectives, uh, both in terms of uh, what's possible, also what's challenging, what can be. Recommendations in a way um, of how to really uh, include uh, both sexes, both genders uh, in um, disaster risk resilience and also climate change adaptation. So I'm just going to follow the list. Uh, I think you have the program as well and ask um, each one of the panelists to start off with their perspectives, what they'd like to offer on this. And then um, after that, we can take you know questions or you know, interventions from the floor as well and have a conversation around it. So to kick off, um, I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Mariam Shisna from the National Disaster Management Authority. She is the Director for Programs, Research and Advocacy and Emergency Management. So we have about five minutes to give the first introduction. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, I have been working with the National Disaster Management Authority for the past 10 years and I'm very close to the island and I don't come in So um, I think that I could bring a lot of their perspective into this session. Um, a lot of times um, when we tend to have a lot of workshops and seminars, it is more organized than uh, in the cities and also in other regions. And we tend to um, really not understand their uh, perspectives and how women in islands, island communities, and smaller communities, how different it could be of women in other cities participate. So I have a lot to bring into the discussions. Uh, um, Please go ahead. An opportunity for others to talk. No, it's okay. You can you can go ahead. Take the floor. Um. Yeah. Um. As from my understanding, I would say um, women are physically more vulnerable. So in terms of disasters and uh, 
when I said in last year, I was more pressed into the climate climate induced disasters that we are having in more days, more frequently, like um, stuff as water flooding, or strong sedimentations. Uh, women are more uh, prone to the impacts of these disasters because um, a lot of times in island communities, women are the people people who are at home taking care of children and elderly while men are out there working and um, uh, they don't really know anything that happens at work. There's a kind of communication uh, problem or anything. So it's the women leading this, uh, trying to solve these issues. But uh, most of the workshops that we have carried out, workshops in terms of uh, emergency response trainings or other disaster management planning workshops that I have carried out. Women have been part of these workshops and in some islands women have been part of these workshops uh, more than men and so they do understand what needs to be done but the issue arises when it comes to the decision making at island levels it's mostly men taking the decision. So sometimes um, women's, um, the, the, the consideration or the needs of women get neglected while making the decisions. So um, I, I guess there is a, a gap between uh, in terms of response and in terms of preparation. So they have knowledge in, uh, for the preparation, but they don't really are not involved in their response. Um, but I guess I could stay in some islands that I know it's a change because when we are training the emergency response teams, women do get more involved, but yet again, because they are more accountable to the children, the elderly, or the uh, household chores. So it, sometimes, even when they know, even when they are part of the teams, they mostly can't get involved in the actual situation in terms of their need as well. So I guess that's something we would need to work on because um, I would like to say that in all of this, a lot most of the women who have access to information, they have access to education, they have access to internet, so they have access to information. They're there, they do know what to do, but it's in the action because a lot of other things can do, you know, that calls what they think in terms of platform, in times of this. And, um, in during response as well, um, women are more prone to uh, other kind of uh, post disaster emergencies or risks that could arise, something like um, economical risks. Maybe, uh, say, for example, if uh, loss of how, uh, husband or loss of the family breadwinner, then it could be an uh, economic loss or risks to the men in the house. And um, she may be accountable in looking after the children. So it could be a, she, in that time, she becomes more vulnerable. Um, and the opposite of this could be men are more emotionally vulnerable. So I, I think this is something that we don't really consider or we don't talk much about is when we talk about women and women. That needs the uh, one that we get neglected. Oftentimes, we forget to talk about men and their emotional vulnerability because they, at, at the back of their head, they do understand that they have a responsibility to provide financially and emotionally to their family. So, anything happens to them, meaning it's, um, it's a loss to their family. So, I guess when we talk about gender mainstream, it's really important. So we should talk about what the impacts, what men and women. Thank you very much. No, that's very enlightening. Um, you know, digging into even amongst women the differences between where they're living, right, uh, island or um, you know city environments in the case of Maldives, and then also this uh, 
gap between getting informed, knowing, and actually taking action or taking decisions. And then I think that last bit that you touched on of the men's needs, which may be different from women too, also speaks to the importance of when you say gender equality, we're not just talking about one sex or the other, it is about both. Thank you so much. Um, let's hear some more perspectives. So I'd like to um, invite Ms. Aisha Appa, the Senior Social Protections Officer in the Ministry of Social and Family Development. I work in the Ministry of Social and Family Development um, and also in the Gender Care Department. So, in well, this uh, question, my main area would be on top of the gender administrating. When we talk about DRR and CPA, um, so it's like uh, uh, we all know that both is geographically that we are located. And we are very prone and we are exposed to all types of weather uh, hazards like droughts, storms, very rainfalls, floods, coastal floods. But the thing is that um, we often do not consider that gender mainstreaming is important to the population. See, that's an area that relaxes not only just in um, when we talk about climate change, but climate change and climate. Um, hazards. In all the sectors, also, we have found, I mean, we realize and we have noticed that we do neglect that sector. Okay? I think that's a good aspect of it. The thing is that the way these disasters impact people, the different groups in our community, is very important. So, if we want to ensure a sustainable and equitable future for people, we need to consider these groups as well, these vulnerable. And most of the time, um, the we know that in it, like everyone who is impacted, but it is felt very disproportionately. It is felt disproportionately more by the most vulnerable in the society, which is the women, young youngsters, and also I would like to mention the persons with disabilities. Um, in Maldives, just like other developing countries. Most women are involved in, uh, most women are more involved in the home based economies. Um, and for example, uh, agriculture or in like uh, fish processing, and with every flood, with every extreme weather condition, there are these economies actually in the population. I think one of the main factors when we talk about women and women is. How independent financially they are. Their economic empowerment is very important. So, when this factor is affected, we, um, they are more vulnerable to these new factors. And um, we have noticed um, it is very different from Mali and other, other islands as well, how women are impacted. Because most of the time in other islands, we find that uh, the women uh, from this home based income, home based um, economic activities, they tend to also their daily expenditures. So, when this daily expenditure stops, it makes them more vulnerable. So, this is why it is so important to, uh, um, to consider uh, gender mainstreaming is so important and we talk about climate um, adaptation, mitigation, and other strategies. Also, I would like to highlight um, on the fact that um, sea level rise so impacts the women. We think it won't, but the thing is, um, due to sea level rise, we, um, it affects the water lenses and the freshwater availability for agriculture and other activities that we do. Again, it has a direct effect on women. And um, we have I mean, we do not have um, specific research done based on this area, how it impacts women. It is uh, an area that we are lacking currently, but through our workshops and through our um, different uh, programs we have conducted around, we have noticed that um, there is a limit uh, access to the accurate information to an extent. We have identified certain areas that they do not have the accurate information. So a 
again, that makes it more, it makes them more vulnerable to such attacks. And as uh, my colleague have again mentioned about how the women are mostly involved in the care giving processes and they're more, in, they're more involved in, in the home at home. So the first people who are affected or infected more is the women. So when we talk about adaptation and mitigation, I think so the ministry is very important because there is a very a huge difference on how it affects men and women. Additionally, I would like to highlight on um, this one point where we can't only talk about the impact, but we also need to talk about how um, you need to talk about the ability they have to bounce back from such and this is also very important for men. So, all the strategies and policies that we are trying to implement should be, it should um, address these vulnerable groups who want to have a fair and equitable environment. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Papa. So, again, echoing, I think, what um, Ms. Shizma was saying too, in terms of women's roles. Um, um, all the you know vulnerabilities they have, but also as caregivers, you know, to others, their family or in their um, homes. We also talked about you know the risks and vulnerabilities in the event of different doctors, but also these slower ones like C W Rise and how that affects the economy of um, and of course you know how to be resilient in terms of um, so from these um, you know um, risks. So um, thank you for um, adding that. So I'm going to um, shift over now. Perhaps you might get a little bit of an international view here too. Uh, may I invite Mr. E.C. Feinbold, the Deputy Representative of UNICEF, who I understand came recently. So I'm sure he has some observations on all this, but also brings in some perspectives from also. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation and also for dedicating a session to this issue that tends to be overlooked. We work on DRR and, and emergency preservedness. Um, globally, women and, and, and also children you know, are two of the groups that are more affected by, by natural hazards. And at the same time, they, they typically have a less significant role uh, and presence in the process of planning and preparedness for, for the RR. And as, as you well said, also people with disabilities are also not uh, fully included in, in these processes. So imagine, for example, a, a child who is a girl and also uh, has a disability is a very vulnerable group that uh, we should be thinking more of and, 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 and putting more efforts in involving uh, them in, in these processes. Uh, for example, in the 2004 tsunami uh, that affected many countries, including Maldives, uh, yeah, one of the things that uh, for my attention is that the number of female deaths were three times the number of male deaths you know, in, all, in all the countries that were affected by, by this uh, terrible uh, natural hazard. And, and this did not reveal the difference in impact on, on, on genders in, in these countries. Uh, one of the countries affected, uh, Sri, Sri Lanka, uh, it was found out that more women died because some of them lacked the skills that helped many men survive, like swimming or tree climbing. Uh, and these were taught to children in Sri Lanka uh, to perform tasks that were done uh, nearly exclusively by, by men. So that's one of the examples of things that, that can happen. Other uh, 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 issues, for example, uh, uh, menstrual hygiene uh, or needs of pregnant, uh, pregnant women can go and address adequately in DRR planning and response if, if, if the girls and women are not well represented. And it's not because men don't want to discuss these things, but uh, uh, we might have uh, blind spots and uh, uh, these are issues that uh, might not be on top of our, of our head when we think of, of, of the planning process. So that's why another example of why it's very important to, to, to have women and girls in, in this in these processes. Uh, a, a key issue that also was mentioned uh, before by, by one of the panelists is in terms of access to information. So 
UNICEF global data shows that, uh, for example, in the case of men, 71% uh, of them receive early warning uh, or emergency from a formal source. And when we compare this number with women uh, receiving uh, warning, 51% uh, receive this through for informal and uh, social sources. So there is an, an inequity in, in how the information is functioning in men and women. So um, we have some examples from, from UNICEF uh, ERR projects in other countries, uh, in this case in Fiji and Solomon Islands, in which uh, women were included in the consultations for, for ERR, and it was part of the project of preparing for emergencies. And women were provided with more information about climate change and, and involved in the process. And uh, it was found um, afterwards that their self-confidence increased and they were more willing after being consulted and involved in the process. Uh, they would feel more confident and capable to take up decision-making role. So that's uh, an example from, from the implementation of projects in, in the field. So in the, in, the, in the case of Maldives, I think it was already mentioned, well, there are issues in terms of uh, the women living in the atolls that tend to be more dependent on climate sensitive uh, natural resources and activities for their livelihood, including uh, subsistence farming, home gardening, and weaving and fish processing. So, and men in the atolls tend to uh, seek work in urban centers and resorts. So, this uh, women. Uh, in the households, maintaining it and caring for children and our parents. And uh, in the female headed uh, households, they tend to be in an economic disadvantage, as I was mentioned before. So, this put them in a more vulnerable uh, situation uh, when a disaster occurs. So, also an example from the, the tsunami, but for Maldives, uh, from the 2004 tsunami, I mean. Um, it was also found out that uh, women were more at risk of violence in the, afterward, in the aftermath of the, the situation and more vulnerable to psychological and emotional stress. Um, th those are some of the, the first points that I want to make and uh, just to add one more before I go to the next one. Um, another important issue is in terms of the, the lack of data. So there's a challenge uh, related to the unavailability of the aggregated uh, data that could help in the analysis and, and decision maker and decision making. So having this information uh, would allow us to have the, the gender lenses to uh, plan better for this. So this is a, a pending issue that uh, we should all work on. Uh, and one one last point, sorry. Um, it's a at the national level, we see uh, an important presence of, presence of women uh, leading the ARR planning and response, you know, uh, including in, in DMA and uh, MRC. Uh, but in the islands, uh, this is not always the case, and we see uh, lower participation. And for example, in the CERTs, in the Community Emergency Response Team that were set, uh, ideally, there should be a composition of 50% of women and men in CERT, but what we are seeing is that it's the participation of women and uh, it's around 35%. So that's another issue related to uh, gender and PR. I have some other points to make, but uh, I will do it later. Uh, I'll try to speak with the five minutes. So. Thank you very much. That's um, very interesting, and particularly like what strikes, you know using that uh, statistics from the 2004 uh, tsunami, that gap, you know, in the number of deaths, I mean, three times, that's really, really, you know, different. And also the um, access to information, how they get information, male, uh, women. I mean, that was really interesting. And also the power of data, actually, we can get from that. But I think the other thing that was kind of interesting observing, you know, the two um, interventions here is that, like, while, um, you know, this consultation of, uh, or inclusion of women in consultations, uh, you know, it's, a, it's not sufficient to actually help them in decision making or taking action. At the same time, there are there is also evidence that it builds confidence, which is one step towards it. So how do you really, you know, help them through the whole 
continue and sound to me as a you know, very key point. Thank you for sharing that. And now I'd like to, um, I'm going to switch, sorry, to online now. So um, you could hold the microphone there. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite Ms. Portia Hunt, who is program advisor in the UN um, Environment Program. So um, over to you. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, hi, everyone. Great to be here virtually. Um, so I'm a program advisor on climate services and early warning systems at UNEP. So this is really where I wanted to focus my intervention today, um, seeing as early warning systems play a key role both in climate change adaptation and in disaster risk reduction as well. Um, I think I recognise a few people on the very small screen um, from when I was back in Mali last year. Um, so for those of you that don't know, UNEP is currently working on developing a Green Climate Fund proposal on early warning systems in Maldives, um, specifically with the Met Service, NDMA and MLC at the national level. So the sort of a few entry points for gender mainstreaming that I wanted to highlight today relate both to some of the planned uh, or proposed activities in the Green Climate Fund proposal um, in Maldives, but also building on some of our existing early warning systems work um, in other small island states. So the first point I wanted to highlight, and I think this builds on the previous intervention in terms of data, is that understanding of gender risks. So as we've heard and as we know, uh, climate change impacts are not gender neutral. Women and girls and other vulnerable groups are disproportionately impacted by climate change and related hazards. So one of the um, activities that we're proposing in Maldives um, is building on MRC's work on vulnerability and capacity assessments and also on the hazard mapping as well. Um, which I know ESCAP is also working on, so building on those um, to better understand and integrate that data to understand the risks that communities face and their vulnerabilities their coping capacities as well, um, and then identify the most at-risk population groups. And then based on this knowledge, be able to target um, subsequent interventions according to the needs of women and other traditionally vulnerable or marginalised groups. Then a key, um, a key point in terms of early warning systems is the warning communication and dissemination. Um, again, I think building on the last intervention, access um, access and understandability of information is really important um, and for early warning systems to be effective this information must be accessible by the whole community um, and sent and disseminated in ways that all members of the community can access it and understand it. So the first step to doing that is really engaging with community members themselves um, not just in Mali, but out um, on the outer islands as well, and specifically with women and other vulnerable groups to really um, understand their needs and capacities in terms of accessing um, information and how they perceive it. Um, and important considerations here, I think, are in terms of language requirements, uh, literacy levels and access to and preferences for different uh, communications assets. Um, so whether that's mobile phones, whether it's radio, whether it's television and um, getting a better understanding of what user specific needs are. And then based on this, uh, tailoring both the early warning information and also other climate information products according to these specific user needs and preferences. Um, and in terms of that tailoring, I think one of them is translating technical information um, into locally understandable and relevant information. Um, I know some of what the Met Service can disseminate is, is very technical and perhaps difficult for some people to understand. So really, there's a need to better understand what, what information is already understandable, what needs to be adapted and what local terminologies perhaps needs to be incorporated so that everyone understands um, when a warning is given. Um, the other thing I mentioned in terms of communication channels, so using multiple communication channels to ensure redundancy, 
um, and also based on different preferences of uh, different population groups. Um, and then also considering where word of mouth can also be used in terms of disseminating information. So are there existing community groups um, or women's networks that can be utilised um, also to complement other forms of um, information dissemination? Uh, then finally, in terms of the dissemination communication, um, something that we discussed back in Mali when I was there last year is around the establishment of two-way feedback mechanisms. Um, firstly, to verify that information has been received, but then also to evaluate whether and how information is perceived and acted upon, because there's while it's great that a warning may has reached someone, if it hasn't been acted upon, it's not really that um, useful. Um, the final point um, that I wanted to highlight for now, I think is around preparedness and response capabilities, which I think really builds on quite a few of the earlier um, interventions. And here I wanted to highlight the need to specifically promote and support meaningful engagements um, and leadership roles uh, for women in disaster preparedness and response. Um, and I think in this respect, a key thing to recognise is that women, they're not just victims of climate change, but really invaluable resources as agents of change. So they have different but valuable knowledge and skills, experiences, coping mechanisms to address and manage climate risks that are really complementary and need to be used. So then in that sense, engaging women is not just about gender equality, but also about increasing the effectiveness overall um, of uh, risk reduction and adaptation. And um, so a few ways to do this, Firstly, is around um, making sure that women are involved sort of at all stages of designing and implementing preparedness plans, which I think was mentioned previously in terms of making sure women are involved in the action itself or response actions. Um, and as we've heard before, with women being the primary caregivers, they can often um, offer a holistic perspective or more holistic perspective on preparedness and response planning, um, for example, that takes into account children and elderly people's needs as well. Um, a couple of other things to highlight are around um, delivering targeted awareness and education campaigns for women so that they can feel ready to mobilise um, in the event of a disaster. And then the final point I wanted to mention was around um, economic empowerment. So if you have disaster risk financing, forecast based financing, making sure that is uh, responsible, uh, sorry, responsive to um, gender needs and accessible um, to women. And um, so I'll stop there, but happy to elaborate and looking forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Portia. Um, I think a lot of um, you know messages resonate with the echo of the previous uh, speakers, but I think um, your emphasis on you know everybody needs to you know have the information, understand the information, and uh, a lot of you know details in there that need to be addressed to make sure that you know everyone, um, including the women and children, uh, get that. I think the other thing you mentioned about the leadership role for parents and that leadership dimension or the agents will change. I mean, I thought also kind of thinking about earlier interventions that, you know, one thing is training and getting information and knowing, but to actually translate that into action decision, I mean, it's a change of role actually, right? So you can't suddenly, in a way, okay, a disaster hits and you become an agent of change. I mean, in a way, the society and the role that you play, the women play in the homes and the society communities already need to kind of already allow that to happen for that, so that when the emergency hits, that is easier to do and perhaps that's part of the preparedness as well. So thanks so much for that. So um, last but not least, I'd like to invite Mr. Ibrahim Shamil, uh, who is manager uh, for programs and services of the Maldivian Red Crescent. I'm sure you have a lot of experience to do uh, work. Thank you again uh, for the invitation and we're very happy to be here. Uh, I think given uh, we got quite a bit of context from the panelists around um, understanding uh, the importance of uh, gender mainstreaming and, and also the situation itself uh, globally and in the 
as I think uh, I try to uh, focus a bit more on uh, working towards mainstreaming like I said and, uh, on the importance of actually creating an enabling environment towards that uh, a lot of the issues uh, we, we understand the risks we understand the challenges uh, for the most part uh, and then they're still kept to kind of identify but uh, at a policy level, as human and actors, as so many agencies who are working with uh, different demographics, uh, including women and other vulnerable groups, uh, it's very key that uh, we work towards you know, creating an enabling uh, environment. So, going from uh, establishing a, a policy or legal frameworks around uh, an integration of uh, you know, gender balance. Uh, Ensure that we include vulnerable groups in the work we do, especially in the work we do in communities. It's very key, uh, and it's been a key area where the United States and DNA and other colleagues have been working on a lot. Or when we're working on a DRR or climate change, climate change education projects, and there's a strong convergence now uh, in, in the work in DRR and DCA or climate change education and. and and the importance on you know creating that environment uh, from from at the top end where you're building laws or policies, which is basically a statement of intent of uh, what we want to achieve. Uh, it, it forms the basis of what we would like to do, what where we can where we can go, I guess, in that sense. And building on that, uh, we, we talked about advocacy or you know, creating that environment and visibility and information. Uh, these sort of uh, we are able to structure that uh, within the existing systems of things in place, files and things. So I just want to focus on on that as well. And I'd like to also share some of uh, our recent work uh, around the uh, DRM projects we're doing in, in partnership with uh, DMA, in particular around uh, where we we are trying to engage. Uh, Communities to prepare for disasters uh, and getting that structure in place in their communities. Uh, as part of the spring project, uh, we, we are working in seven island communities. Uh, and one of the key outcomes we are trying to achieve uh, from this project is namely the establishment of uh, uh, the, the development of an island disaster management plan and a disaster management committee uh, as an outcome of the plan itself. Uh, on the islands we have worked so far, uh, we, we, we are working in a manner where we, we conduct workshops uh, in the development of the plan, uh, identify the roles and responsibilities of the key personnel in the community, uh, what what they can do during the process, and what that, what has been done in the past as well. And, and quite a few things stick out when you're discussing about you know uh, working with uh, vulnerable groups in the community. Highlighted um, some of the past highlighted the, the importance of the role women play in uh, as caretakers or people who, who are responsible for their families, who look after their families and uh, caretakers of the role. And and by sort of seeing what's happened and what's in uh, what we need to work towards, it's very clear that the the importance we need to put on uh, empowering uh, people who are in this position in either communities especially. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, engagement and participation or eagerness to participate, we, we observe that the, the participants are, we try and keep a balance of 50-50 you know, uh, participants, male and female, but quite a number of times it's more female than male uh, and who participate in these workshops. And, and we can observe you know, the eagerness uh, and what they bring to the table in terms of the discussions or the challenges they have. Uh, we, if, I, if I'm not wrong, I think we so far in our workshops, we've had 127 participants altogether, 58 of them have been given in, in these workshops. And, and they've been able to sort of really bring in, in the, the role they play, the role of the Women's Development Committee, uh, which plays the uh, community, and how they are able to mobilize people in times of disasters or emergencies to really bring together the community in this situation, both to bring them to safety and also post recovery, what role or what they can be in. So I think uh, I've stopped there, but I'd like to sort of highlight the importance of creating that uh, institutional, uh, you know, and uh, enabling environment within all sectors where we are trying to bring in, you know, that talent or 
Right. No, thank you very much, Mr. Shamil. Really bringing in that um, the enabling framework, the institutional approach, the more systemic approach, um, and you highlighted the policy legal framework and the coherence convergence there, which is important. But also, you know, on the ground, how to implement it and to structure it as like these uh, island plans or island committees in which women are part of so that they can assist more systematically, I guess, you know, sort of contribute and uh, benefit. So thanks very much. Um, I think all five uh, interventions here uh, uh, bring in different dimensions and example, but I think there are some common messages um, and complementary you know, messages. I would like to open the floor for questions or other contributions. Then we take a few, and then um, if you have any, you know, anyone you'd like to address it to, maybe you can um, highlight that too, so that when the uh, response round comes, um, you know, the person can also respond. So online and also here in the room, any anybody? Anything that surprised you? Any thought provoking? Any sharing of experience from your, you know, work or life even? What you've seen? Okay, we have a little bit of, uh, yes, I'll, I'll let you reflect. You have anything? Let, let me ask you, so out of this, for instance, and you've heard each other as well, what do you think is important to really fast track, accelerate, really, you know, again, there, sometimes it's a race against time, right, this preparedness, and it's not like one day after another, you can change the way you behave or to, you know, um, contribute or play a role in community or society. So in that light, to really expedite this as, you know, fast and you know, robustly as possible. What is key? What is important? Uh, yeah, I think I would like to highlight a few annoying things um, as other panelists have highlighted. Um, we have a lot of uh, women who are doing home-based um, businesses. So when it get infected, um, it's their livelihood getting affected. Like, so uh, that's one thing I think that's one area that we like data. We need to identify how their livelihoods are affected. So um, uh, I'm saying this because they are becoming more economically vulnerable and their livelihood can be affected. Um, uh, also, I would like to bring up one thing that uh, in 2000, 2022, I guess um, there was this uh, national uh, financial inclusion survey done by uh, Montes Monetary Authority, and it shows that uh, uh, account ownership of men and women, so um, it's twice more for the big men than women. So it means that there are a lot of women who do economical work, who do a uh, work as in home, but then they are, they have the, their salary that get, goes into the husband's and maybe their father's account. So they are not, ex they, are, they don't really have the full access to all they are, the diamond they are. So this is also something we need to we'll consider, especially during the disaster situations. So um, that again comes to the point that I, I mentioned earlier that we need to have this data so that we could you know, come up with a solution that maybe um, we can uh, identify and show ways or methods that these women can work on to make sure that uh, their or organization or their work they are doing based in home is not affected by climate induced or other kind of disasters. So those data is a need that we have to have. Can I ask a question? 
So uh, the census data was just recently released, and we actually received the island level data, which was very interesting. But you know, to have those kind of disaggregated information, there is more details necessary, right? It, even within the islands, when the location of the housings are different, the exposure to different hazards based on the level of elevation, based on the uh, you know, location within the islands, everything is different. So what are the initiatives, what are the works that are necessary to make sure that that connection happens between organizations to get actually data in that, you know, a smaller scale in that kind of geospatial uh, level that allows us for more uh, interaction between the data and other kind of information that is available from climate projection, from other aspects. Uh, because one of the things I heard, I don't know if it's actually that the, uh, basically location of the uh, household that were served was identified in the very recent census. So what are the ways that agencies can really work with each other to ensure that the data comes out and then you try to kind of, you know, bring out all of these different dimensions because census really bring a lot of answers to, you know, uh, this aggregation between uh, age groups, between even migrants, uh, domestic individuals, uh, I mean, uh, immigrants uh, and uh, local partners and different, different, really a lot of different categories. So what are the needs here to ensure that uh, ministries, agencies that, that are relevant are working with each other to uh, provide this data for the purpose of CCA and the other? Can I jump in with a, a bit of a provocative one, right? I mean, you're saying, you know, data is there, but we need coordination. I heard in the previous panel that coordination is the most difficult thing to do institutionally. So I would even challenge all this data collection is actually happening. And you say there's no data or there's a lack of data. Data collection takes time. What, I mean, what, what needs to change? If it hasn't happened until today, you know, it's not probably today that you discover this is a, you know, this is an important piece of information, but yet it hasn't happened. So what needs to change to actually allow the end result, which is to understand what, and women to understand what it means with all this risk, how they cope, how they address, how do they contribute in, in their family or their community? So thinking a little bit out of the box, what do you think needs to change? What do needs to happen? Well, whatever it is a discussion, but I want to push this because again, things don't happen. You know, I mean, if it hasn't happened, then the likelihood of it happening is going to be pretty low unless you change. So, so um, what I, my opinion is that we can talk about all these strategies and what has to happen and what needs to be done, right? And also, we even do have policies also. So we do have um, strategies and actions, plan, action plans as well. But uh, here we're talking about gender mainstreaming and including gender in vulnerable groups. The thing that I feel, what I, in my opinion, like is the implementation process. There's some the financing or the budgeting that lacks. Because when we talk about policies, no, no, when we talk about policies and the laws, uh, it is there. But we, I think, we lack understanding that. These adaptation strategies and these um, mitigation strategies, it, it is very different. It, it would be very different from um, one group to the other. So to implement these, we need the budget, we need the financing. So um, the gender budgeting is an approach that we can use I think, when we want to talk about the implementation process. And also another thing that is lacking is the monitoring and the evaluation that we need to do. We 